Can you all hear me okay? Wonderful. Let's get started. Uh, so I tend to talk extremely quickly, as you will find out. I have 10 minutes, so it's going to be even quicker than usual. Uh, this talk is called Value Your Types. Um, I just want to thank all of you for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you to Bang Bang Con. Thank you to our sponsors, to UC Santa Cruz, uh, and like I said, to, uh, to all of you. So uh, my name is Eric Weinstein. I work for a company called Test Double. Uh, we're software consultants. Uh, software is broken. We try to make it better. Uh, please, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at eric at testdouble.com. Uh, most of the time, I'm on the internet uh, at Eric Q. Weinstein. Uh, there are lots of Eric Weinsteins, but I'm Q. Um, <laughs> People often ask me what the Q stands for, uh, and I usually kind of uh, perversely tell them it stands for Q. Um, <laughs> that is not true, but if you're curious what it does stand for, please uh, feel free to come find me after the show. <laughs> All right, so this talk is on dependent types. Who knows what dependent types are or has heard of them? Awesome, cool. So you can all correct me after this talk is done. Um, <laughs> and as long as you don't start with, well, actually, we'll be in, we'll be in awesome shape. Um, so uh, I think most of us are familiar with type systems and the idea of types in programming languages. A dependent type is a type uh, that depends on a value. So rather than just list of integers, you can have a dependent type where you say a list of integers where each entry in that list is uh, strictly larger than the one before it. Um, so you can have a monotonically increasing sequence or you can have a pair and say, you know, the second value has to be larger than the, the first one. Uh, dependent types have actually been around in some form for a long time. Uh, so back in 1934, Haskell Curry uh, discovered that there are similarities and in fact uh, a correspondence between the typed lambda calculus and propositional logic. So if this, then that, this, therefore that, uh, this and that, this or that, et cetera. Um, but things got really interesting in the 1960s when uh, William Howard, and I'm going to pronounce this name incorrectly, but I'm going to try very hard, uh, Nicolas uh, de Bruyne uh, extend, uh, de Bruyne actually, I think it's closer. I'll talk to Jerry afterwards. Um, extend uh, Curry's work to predicate logic. Um, and so I found a very nice uh, graphic on the internet. Uh, credits appear down at the bottom that tell you what all this means. So let's say we want to make an array, right? We have two types here, a pi type on top and a sigma type on the bottom. Um, and what these really boil down to um, are uh, the universal and existential quantifiers. So uh, this first one basically says for all x, we can make this array, um, which is kind of awesome. Uh, and the sigma type corresponds to the uh, uh, existential modifier, so universal on top, existential on the bottom. Um, existential meaning there exists an x, there's at least one x such that this is true. Uh, and this is actually kind of astounding because as we see, um, Haskell Curry has worked on this back in 1934. William Howard and, uh, and uh, de Bruyne have looked, uh, worked on this more recently, about 50, 60 years ago. Um, but Curry and Howard are names that we probably know because of the Curry-Howard correspondence, the idea that these propositional, these, these logical ideas uh, actually are one-to-one -one with programs. But this was kind of mind-blowing for me because I didn't know that dependent types were part of this and that you can actually encode all of this, you know, this notion of universal and existential uh, quantifier with dependent types. And uh, the language that I know that uh, implements dependent types the best, uh, or at least the one I'm most familiar with, is a language called Idris, which is named after a cartoon dragon. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so uh, if you're familiar with Haskell, this will look relatively straightforward. If you're not, that's okay. Um, I was going to put in that, uh, I don't know if you've seen this on Twitter, there's someone, if you're, I think a couple years ago, basically uh, had this picture where like, they replaced all of the uh, English letter characters, the Latin characters, uh, with hieroglyphics, and you still get the Haskell type signatures, but it's like little birds and rivers and stuff like that, and people found that equally confusing. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting, that you can kind of translate them into hieroglyphics and people are still, um, you know, uh, uh, shrug emoji. Uh, anyway, so this is a vector. Um, so in this case, we basically have a sequence of a defined length. Um, so to help you read this, a data vector takes a natural number um, and a type and gives you a type. And the idea here is if you have uh, nil, you just have the empty vector of a. It doesn't matter what a is because there's nothing in it. There's a length of zero. Otherwise, you have uh, an a and a bunch of, so x of type a and more x's, uh, which are, and the x's are just a vector of that length of type a. And you get a vector if you add this x of type a to the existing list of type a's. You get a vector of length n plus 1. So the cool thing here is you have a type that actually tells you how many items are in your vector. Now, if you look at the Idris language um, website, you can go to idrislang.org slash example. They use z and s for zero and uh, successor. But the idea is the same. Basically, if you have a vector of a's of some length n and you add one more, you now have a vector of a's that is one larger than the one that you had before. And the fact that the type system can tell you this, I think, is, is really amazing. So let's look at what this can be used for. Right. So here's an example. Uh, this function is called pair add. You can imagine you have two vectors, uh, and you want to add all the elements in them. So if you have 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6, you might want to say 1 and 3 is 4, uh, 2 and 5 is 7, and 3 and 5 is 8, if I did that right. Probably not. Um, 4, 5, 6, sorry, 3 and 6 is 9. Anyway, math. Um, so we'll talk about totality in a second. 
But the idea here is you have uh, numeric A, so this is very similar to Haskell's notion of type classes. These are actually, I think, interest interfaces. But what you're saying is you have something that implements numeric, where you have a total ordering. You have a vector of these A's, you actually have N of them, and uh, you take two vectors of length N of A's, and you get a vector of A's that is also of length N. So the type system is actually telling you that if you add these two vectors pairwise together, you will get another vector of the same type that is the same length as the original. Um, so pair add nil, nil equals nil. Uh, this is because if you take the head of the empty list, you get nil or nothing in, in an iterus. Um, and then otherwise, if you take an x and some x's, so the head of the list and the rest of it, and do the same thing for your second vector, you just add those two together, and then you recursively do the same for the rest of your lists, which is actually, again, astounding that the type system can tell, us, uh, can tell you this. Another good example, uh, again, we have a total function, um, and I'll tell you about totality in a second. Uh, so append, we have a vector uh, of length n of a's again, and now another vector that is of length m of a's, and the resulting vector is n plus m. So we actually have in the type system a guarantee that if we take these two vectors and add them together, they will be the right length. So again, if we append nil, we just get what we had before. Uh, otherwise, we take the head of the list and the rest of them, we take our y's, and we say we're just gonna recursively go ahead and say we're gonna append our x's to our y's. So I think this is astounding that the type system does all of this for us. Um, like I said, this is, this is nuts that you actually have this in your type annotation. Um, Totality, um, basically the idea here is that you're telling the uh, interest compiler, I want you to yell at me if I have not covered every possible input. I want to guarantee that my function is well-defined for all inputs and that it will eventually terminate. Um, now, Idris has ways of handling totality, but the nice thing about saying total here is that you're gonna get the compiler to yell at you immediately at compile time if you don't do this. Now, I've done some work on Idris, and it's really tough to find a lot of practical examples, right? Uh, people are, I think, relatively new to dependent types. There's not a lot of really cool stuff that's being done with it in production now, um, but I found this issue on a book uh, about type theory on, on GitHub, and the really fascinating thing here is that we are already doing these, these things, and, and I'm just gonna read the highlighted part real quick. In computer science, the dependent types are everywhere, but they are not typically captured by code. Uh, programmers think informally in terms of dependent types all the time, they're just not aware of it. For example, something like string copy is really a dependent function because the length of the input string depends on the size parameter, right? But this is not visible in the function declaration, it's just part of the docs. And what do we know? That if we take something that the programming language can do and we push it into the docs, it doesn't get done, we find a stale comment, and we fight with things and things are on fire. So I really like putting these things in the programming language because then I don't have to worry about it, the computer worries about it. A brief aside, so I mentioned I was doing some web stuff with Idris years ago, uh, I wanted to contribute to the core language, and I said, hello, I would like to use the socket library. The socket library is currently broken. Um, and the response was, huh. Okay, well, if you'd like to fix it, here's how we go about this. Uh, and I was confused because, you know, things like the socket library being broken sounded pretty critical. So I said, how did this get to be like this? I feel like I'm not the first person who's had this problem. The answer was that I was. Uh, <laughs> and so having this conversation, the conversation was very, very collegiate, very nice, awesome. The folks over at Idris are delightful. But the under, this, is, this might be in my imagination, but the idea here was uh, sort of the, the subtext was, uh, you know, in, they're, they're almost like, what are you doing with Idris? And I said, well, I would like to put cat pictures on the internet. That's, what I, that's why I program things, so I can put cat pictures, uh, cat pictures on the internet. Uh, and so they responded um, and said, that's interesting. And I said, well, what do you use Idris for? Uh, and they said, well, we're using it for you know, um, proof assistance and, and formal verification. And I was like, well, that's weird. Like, I don't know why you guys are doing that. And they're like, I don't know why you guys are doing that. <laughs> so it was really fascinating to have this programming language that we were both super delighted to use and completely different use cases, where each of us thought the other person was like, right, you do you, I guess, but anyway. <laughs> um, So very quickly, we're gonna talk about undecidability in type language, uh, in type theory. Um, apologies for going so fast, but I've got about a minute left. So undecidable, right? <laughs> I'm not sure that word means what I think it means. Um, but the idea here is, um, when types contain values, they can become little programs. And if you have two little programs and you generally want to know if those two programs are going to do the same thing, for all possible inputs, uh, that is actually undecidable which is super scary. Luckily, like we talked about totality earlier, uh, you can tell the address to yell at you if something's not total, but generally speaking, at compile time, it's only going to evaluate things that it knows are total already, which means that type checking remains decidable and everybody is happy. Anyway, I've got about 20 seconds left. I'm really happy. These are the papers that I had used to talk about type theory, to learn about things, to learn about the Haskell query correspondence and you know, with regard to dependent types and things like that. Um, so feel free to take a look at these. I'm gonna put these up on uh, speaker deck and share the link uh, on Twitter in a little bit. Like I said, I'm usually at Eric Q Weinstein. Q is in Q. Um, in case I talked way too fast or you got tired, um, TLDPA, too long, didn't pay attention. Uh, dependent types <laughs> are amazing. Idris is amazing and you should try it. You all are amazing. Thanks so much, that's all I've got. <laughs>